Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief on the week of the 13th of November 2023. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman and it is indeed November already. It's hard to believe really. Uh, this year seems to have really flown by in some ways. Uh, I mean what, 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 what do you think? I know quite a lot has happened to you uh, this year. That's, that sounds traumatic, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, to 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 to, uh, to paraphrase and change gender, uh, uh, something that Margaret Thatcher once said: uh, "We we we are a grandfather." Yeah. Um, which it, it is. Uh, it, it is that we're, we're also celebrating the four uh, hundredth anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare's first folio, and there's that line in. Um, uh, in Henry the Fourth, I think it's, is it part one or part two? One of the Henry the Fourth plays, anyway. But where where the uh, some of the older characters uh, are, are chewing the fat in the yard of the pub and uh, or in, in in the garden, and in, and one of them says, um, "We have heard the chimes of midnight, Master Shallow." <laughs> and uh, so yeah, um, the, chimes, okay. the, chime, the chimes of midnight are chiming. Yeah, I bet. But um, hopefully a long, uh, but, but it's a, uh, uh, hopefully still a long way away. Some way off, yeah. Just, 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 yeah. just thinking, don't get too dark on us, Andy. Um, but uh, <laughs> regardless of, of whether we hear the chimes of midnight, our watching brief continues. And this week we have a selection of things to talk about. Uh, this is stuff that uh, has been folded together from uh, last the last sort of 10 days, I guess. Uh, not least because we were looking to fold in other things as well. And it's all basically, we basically separated out this episode and an interview that you probably have already seen by now uh, with Bill Farley. So uh, this week uh, we are presenting a range of things to uh, to examine and to consider below. And some of these things uh, seemingly get me quite irritated. I didn't realize how irritated I was until we started talking about them. Yeah, uh, no, it's it's it, it's it's uh, if, if you like uh, viewer, dear viewer, it, um, it, it's our sort of standard magazine format, really, yeah. rather than a, a extended interview. So we're, we're this is, yeah, this is the, the the watching brief magazine playing catch up with the heritage and archaeological news of the last few weeks. Yeah, so enjoy. Which uh, begins in this instance with uh, yeah, a piece of uh, piece of good news uh, regarding the National Trust and uh, its annual general meeting. Well. As I say, as a as a an objective journalist, I have to say um, it will be good news to some people, mm -hmm. a lot of people actually, probably certainly a lot of people in the heritage sector. Yeah. Um, no, but um, basically, um, the coincidentally, it's claimed with the National Trust AGM, which took place last weekend uh, on the eleventh of November, um, twenty twenty three. If you're looking at this in archive, um, the Director of Restore Trust, uh, Zuditu Gabriel Hanas, uh, is moving on to a new job. Mm. She's going to become a senior researcher for the Legatum Institute, which is a right wing think tank. <laughs> now, strangely enough, some people say she's already been connected with the, the right wing, -wing think, think tank, tank and, yes. And a, yeah, ob obscurely funded organizations because Restore Trust um, has, under her directorship, tried for the last two years to get uh, met, uh get get its supporters elected to the national trust council mm. which helps form the policy of the national trust one of the britain's uh, biggest environmental and heritage charities mm. uh if not the biggest and um also to get motions supporting its philosophy of um telling uh, history unvarnished um, well, well, without, well. Any, without with, without woke well um, uh, telling less history you could say you could say that I couldn't possibly. <laughs> um, no, that, um, basically, the, uh, this year as last year, they tried to get a slate of candidates elected to the National Trust Council, mm. and also <clears throat> two motions passed. One of which was to do a facsimile um, reconstruction of uh, Clanton House, I think it's called, the, uh, which was burnt out a few years ago. Mm. Um, basically, the insurance money has come through, and the trust has been debating what to do with it. They're talking about reimagining it as a um, as a ruin, and, and that it's not practical or desirable to try and create a facsimile of what it was. Mm -hmm. um, Restore Trust claim that that's actually to deny the history, and um, passed a, 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 a wanted a motion to um, counter uh, um, to, to, to contradict the the, the trust policy. Uh, and also to change the voting system. The, um, both motions failed, and they failed yet again to get anyone elected to council. Mm. 
yeah. um, and that was on what was reported as a, a, a record turnout of National Trust members voting. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, an accompanying sound effect to all of their efforts would be something along the lines of... So, yeah. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, I mean, it, basically, it, it it it's it claims to be a grassroots uh, organisation. In yeah. fact, all the evidence is it's what's called an astroturf organisation that is heavily supported by particularly the Daily Telegraph newspaper. Astroturf, um, astroturf being fake grassroots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Now, it, um, on the, on what the, happens to National Trust in future? Uh, will they get a, a, a dynamic new director to replace Ms. Gabrielanis? Um or will it just quietly slip away as the Sunak government appears to be trying to do? Indeed, indeed. Restore trust. Um, we, we, we knew you so little. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it's also worthwhile saying that, that there are National Trust uh, properties that uh, are essentially shells. There's one just up the road from me, Seaton Delaval Hall, um, which uh, uh, recently actually have been voted one of the best attractions in the area, in the Northeast, yeah. in the National Trust's yeah. catalogue, because it's an interesting place. To, it's interesting to see the shell of a building sometimes and how it's presented and how it's used can be very creative. And crucially, all of the history about the building is still there. They're not denying anything that happened in the building. It's just that they, there's not, it's not practical to reconstruct that. that, that. And, and, and that's precisely the situation in, 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 in this case. What um, Restore Trust was citing was a case of a house called Upark House in Sussex, hmm. which was... Um, reconstructed as a facsimile but in that case uh, pretty much all the contents had survived that had been removed mm. um, and um, there were spit particular uh, conditions um, that in, in this case uh, in, in fact the the, the, um, the published ideas sound really exciting and as you say I, I you know we, we can all point to you know ruins romantic educational whatever that are just as impressive just as in, important as if a building survived intact. Reconstruct the path and on. Oh no, God, no, no, we can't say that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Are you preempting our next story? <laughs> uh, well, actually, even that wouldn't be actually a reconstruction, would it? But um, no, no. Uh, well, it, 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 that story is is uh, is uh, yeah. Heck, why not? It's it's another good piece of news. It's another good story. It is um, the news that George Osborne is continuing in his efforts to to mo to poke at. Uh, government policy and to um try and find room to maneuver in terms of his, his power uh, at, the, at the british museum to well as, as as the headline here says uh make it clear that he is eager to reach a partner on marbles deal and uh that's a good thing again the, the, i think the more the more the more we hear about the bm as uh being being the ones who are struggling against the the government, the more clear this issue becomes, hopefully, for people who just hear British Museum and and immediately imagine, you know, a, a Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde sort of villain whisking uh, artifacts away into the night. Um, it's interesting though that uh, so, yeah, this, this wriggle room that he's creating really uh, sort of uh, ripples. Um, much stronger, obviously, in Greece. So, for example, we've got a link down below to thegreekreporter.com uh, where they highlight the chairman of the British Museum trustees, George Osborne, has said that he hopes he can reach an agreement with Greece that would see the Parthenon marbles temporarily returned in exchange for ancient artefacts that have never been seen in the UK. So it's uh, that they're reporting it with fairly total clarity. And and again, this, this must be good as well for international relations. Oddly enough, Osborne possibly being more of a statesman than he ever has been um, while, while running the British Museum. You know. Well, given that his old boss and uh, uh, preempting another story, we're going to be talking about the King's Speech and, and the government's uh, programme in a minute, but um, given that his old boss has just been recalled to uh, to public service as Foreign Secretary. Uh, yes, people yes. Are, Lord uh, Cameron. No, uh, people are a bit... Yeah, exactly. Lord, 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 Lord Cameron of Piggate. Um, no, people, people have. Uh, please don't look that up. Um, but um, no, pe people have been um, joking that uh, the way things are going, George Osborne will be back as Chancellor of the Exchequer before Christmas. But um, <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be mad to take the job. He would. Um, he's, having, he's obviously having too much fun as chair yeah. of the BM. I mean, even, even with the other issue, which we're going to talk about in a sec, with the, you know the. the the, the objects that have gone missing. Mm. Um, shall, shall I just explain quickly for our viewer what, what the circumstances of this actually were? Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the quotes that Mark's just given from Osborne, uh, actually, uh, and, and again, this is 
trolling of the government of the highest quality. Hmm. Um, because having floated the idea of a, some sort of informal deal outside of the British Museum Act, therefore preventing the government from stopping it, um, at the Department for Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee a few weeks back, which we talked about on the show, um, last week the, um, the British Museum uh, had its annual dinner hmm. for its trustees, and they held it in the Parthenon Gallery. And so in the shadow of the, some of the Parthenon marbles, mm. George Osborne floated this idea again of a swapsies deal with the Greek government, which would mean that nobody would actually relinquish ownership, certainly for the time being, which would enable the whole thing to go ahead as a standard museum swap. Mm -hmm. um, the government couldn't intervene, um, and um, certainly legally, although it might, uh, it might huff and puff a lot. And um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, in his tenure as chair of governors, and I don't think it's just a distraction from the missing objects. Uh, I think this was this was happening before the missing object scandal broke. Hmm. Um, but um, I think Osborne, as you say, he wants to be a statesman in. Um, on, on, on the cultural scene uh, using, uh, you know, wielding Britain's or the British Museum's soft power and um, well, well, but, another, this is another indication it's happening yeah well and also in that sense he's actually he's acting with conviction it seems like no matter what happens at uh, uh, gov in government for example we've recently lost probably one of the most performatively cruel um, senior politicians I've ever known uh, in cabinet um, at, at the at the, um, at the home office uh, no matter how those you haven't you have you haven't seen my my resi my, 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 my the letter I've got drafted for when you sat me. <laughs> well, this is true. This is true. But that's the thing. I, I know I'm performatively cruel. Um, <laughs> oh no, cool. I'm performatively cool. Uh, that's not much better. Uh, but no. The, the, despite that, despite whatever the 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 wind, um, where, which direction the wind may change to with 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 a reshuffle and so on and so forth, uh, he's he's remaining fairly fairly convinced of, of his argument and um you know in that sense good on him again uh, you know 10 years ago there's no way i would ever would have thought i'd be praising george osborne um but but you know well done to the man well done um speaking i mean but, but I, I, see, I have to say that, 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 that there is quite a crafty piece of politics here as well in that it, it does put the greek government on the spot because the greeks have said they'll never come to an arrangement which doesn't involve them taking back legal ownership legal mm. title uh, and so it could be knocked back by the Greek government on those grounds, but um, in it, it, you know, in it would that would have to be pretty performative in its own right, uh, because and, po and politics is the art of the possible. So in that sense, politics is the art of the possible. Yeah. And, uh, possible, uh, and 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 if there is a deal that sees Parthenon marbles back in Athens, does anyone really expect them to come back to London? No, no, exactly. Uh, yeah. Speaking of London and the British Museum, uh, the uh, the terms of the Independence Review, terms of reference, have been published. Independent Review, sorry, not Independence Review. Yeah. Um, uh, into the collection, security, and governance of the museum. And uh, is, is there any surprises? Are there any surprises of when this was first announced? There was the possibility that 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 it looked a little bit like maybe they were going to try and mark their own homework uh, and so as much as we've just been praising a potentially fairly um um what's the word uh proactive and progressive uh move in terms of the Parthenon marbles uh is this is this a, a, a mark against the, the museum well since we last talked about it they have um the the, the, the there are co-chairs um so Nigel Boardman, uh, Lucy Dorsey, and Ian Carrot. Hmm. Um, now, uh, Mr. Carrot has no previous connection with the British Museum, but Lucy Dorsey was made um, or appointed to the audit committee of the trustees, British Museum trustees, in July, hmm. and Sir Nigel Boardman is a former trustee. Hmm. So, in a sense, you've got. Two in-house, one independent co-chair. 
Um, they say in the opening paragraphs of the overview that this has been cleared with the Charity Commission. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Mr. Carrot uh, is there because he's a particular specialist in charity law and governance. Um, it's also pointed out that none of them are being remunerated for their role. Mm. Now, the other review members, um, and this is where I think people might have an issue. Um, if I just read straight from the terms and conditions, and we'll link to the um, to, to the document that the BM published, not with too much fanfare, it has to be said, mm -hmm. um, but um, including included on the review, the British Museum's head of internal audit, the head of security, the head of visitor services, the keeper of Greet and Rome, and other such persons as confirmed in writing by the co-chairs and the chair of trustees. The review will work closely with the British Museum's interim director. In other words, this isn't an independent review, actually. It's an internal review. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I suspect, depending on what turns up, and particularly depending on what's happened with the police case, um, as often happens with these kind of issues, it might be escalated to a fully independent review within under a, probably an independent KC, mm. uh, K uh, K uh, King's Council, a senior lawyer with uh, with arts experience to um, to chair. Um, the the um, objectives. Uh, there's a few other interesting nuggets in in uh, in the document. One of which um, is the suggestion that they still don't know what's missing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, the, um, it, 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 it's, it's partly, a, it, to call it a fishing expedition would be wrong, but it, it's, it, 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 it's primary objective appears to be just to clarify what the heck's gone on. Right. Yeah. If that's possible. Well, and hence, hence possibly the reason that it's been published without great fanfare, um, mm. you know, they'd much rather people were talking about about Osborne trying to return the old the Pardon the Marbles than uh this this uh massive um uh well cock up yeah. at best. I, yeah. I, I, just, just just very quickly, I think the difficulties that they're facing is is pointed up in um the um final bullet points of the objectives. Um it describes uh, and I'll just quote directly. Um to carry out a programme for the recovery of affected objects that are missing or stolen. This shall involve the conduct and control, with the oversight and approval of the trustees, of civil litigation in support of the recovery programme, including, where appropriate, civil litigation against persons suspected in involvement with the theft stroke damage of the affected objects during the relevant period, and persons suspected of possessing missing affected objects. Mm. Um, now... That civil litigation would be overridden by any criminal charges that may or may not be brought. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, um, that uh, yeah, that suggests again um, that they don't know where and who has what. And um, but they're saying basically they want it back. Yeah, and they'll take action to get it back. Yeah, and we must remember as well. Not that long ago, they were asking for the public's help in identifying where this stuff might be Indeed. as well. So they clearly, yeah, there's clearly lots of question marks. Indeed. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of, of things missing, um, we have uh, in this this uh, re most recent King's speech <coughs> that, for folks at home who may not know, is the formal opening of the uh, the new term year session of Parliament. Um, it, it involves the monarch. The last one was actually delivered by Prince Charles on behalf of his mum, uh, his mother. And uh, this year, uh, it is his own king's speech, the first in 78 years, I think they were saying, technically yes. speaking. Uh, and uh, you have reported on this on the pipeline. Um, uh, and, well, you say here it's a short story, although you did manage to get a fair fair bit of ink out of this very short story, I, I should say. Well, that's because of one bill, in, one proposed bill in particular, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we'll come to that in a sec, maybe. I mean, um, for, for anyone that's not, not familiar with it, the, um, the King's Speech, as, as you say, it's where the government um, begins a new se session of Parliament. So basically, Parliament starts again from scratch. Mm. All the old bills have be, uh, have either been passed or dropped, and the government proposes a new program of legislation for the the, the current parliament. Mm. Um, uh, it, it doesn't require a general election. It's a sort of the administrative st full stop 
new paragraph, but um, it, it's quite important in British politics. Mm. Um, the King's speech uh, is always written by the government. It's not; it's delivered by the monarch, but it's not actually. Um, it's not actually they have no input into the content um and in, and in fact some people have argued that the fact that um the king delivered it in a thoroughly disinterested monotone particularly the element on rowing back on uh, environmental uh, mm. issues by grant um by granting new oil and gas licenses in the north sea um mm. which it's known that uh, the king thoroughly approve, uh, disapproves of so he's a you know, he was an environmentalist before it was fashionable yeah um so uh there's that element to it and, and, and in fact I, I, um well when, when i was thinking about preparing this I, I, re I was reminded of an old um cover on private eye magazine from many years ago now which is the the queen as as was the, the current king's mother delivering the um the, the the speech from the uh steps of the throne in the house of lords and she's got a, a speech bubble coming out of her mouth saying i don't write this crap you know yeah uh, <laughs> Well, and it and it is, but it is delivered uh, again for people who may be interested from uh, a sort of a, a a standpoint of saying my government will. Yes. So because it is it is His Majesty's government, uh, that's mm -hmm. why the monarch has to start Parliament up again and effectively give permission for Parliament to happen. It's again, it's all formal. It's all you know. It's all technicalities. But that's why, yeah, that's why he's given a speech of things that his government plans to do, and then he announces them. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's not a huge amount um, in the King's speech to directly impact the heritage world. There's a few bills which may have impacts, like, for example, uh, changes to uh, data protection rules, which could affect uh, research, for example, and databases. Mm -hmm. So people who are doing, doing oral history research, say, in, in connection with the uh, contemporary archaeology or something like that, that, that there may be kind of peripheral effects like that. Mm. Um, the, the main um, impact of the current government on Heritage World has actually already passed. That's the, um, the levelling up bill, which passed in the last parliament, um, towards the end of the last parliament, which, uh, again, we've talked about, which uh, made um, historic environment records uh, for local authorities statutory in the planning system and um, a few, there are a few other things coming forward. Mm -hmm. A watching brief is a formal program of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing watching brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared, and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. There was one that, um, bill, though, in particular, which uh, is... Um, is pointed up in the King's speech, um, and that's the bill to enable the building of a National Holocaust Memorial Centre and Learning uh, Centre mm. in the Victoria Tower Garden next to the Houses of Parliament, uh, mm -hmm. next to the River Thames. Now, this is very controversial. Um, the bill would um, disapply a legislation from 1900, in fact, which required the park to be uh, to remain as a public park in perpetuity, um, mm -hmm. and that's what stopped the that uh, it was the the London County Council Improvements Act of 1900, um, and that prevented the uh, the Holocaust Memorial Centre going forward when it went to judicial review. The mm. judicial review found that the government had acted unlawfully mm -hmm. in ignoring the 1900 Act. The new bill would disapply the troublesome sections of that Act. Now. The thing about this is obviously, um, put it this way, and, and I, I, I'm included in, 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 in this scheme, uh, this school of thought. Uh, I have absolutely no idea, uh, sorry, no idea, I have absolutely no problem with the idea of a National Holocaust Memorial, mm -hmm. um, and certainly not with teaching people about the events in, uh, in, in Germany from 1933 to 1945. Mm -hmm. And 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 in, uh, and in occupied Europe, 
um, and the mass murder of Jewish people because they were Jewish people, but also of you know, Roma, of gay people. Homosexual people, um, gay people. Homosexual, uh, yeah, Jehovah's, disabled Jehovah's people. Witnesses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. The T4 yeah. program, which murdered disabled and, and mentally ill yeah. people. Um, you know, so there's absolutely no problem with any of that. And I think, I, I, you know, uh, and, and, and certainly the opposition isn't on any grounds of that type. It's, they're basically, it's right idea, wrong place. The park's quite small. Mm -hmm. It's one of the few green spaces in that part, of, uh, quiet green spaces, where you can go in that part of Westminster. Mm -hmm. um, it already has significant um, memorials, um, in, including uh, a, a copy of the Rodin Burgers of Calais. Um, and it became a, an impromptu memorial when the MP Joe Cox was murdered uh, just before the referendum in 2016. Mm. Um, and, and quite a moving, quiet place to think about the implications of that mm. so uh, opponents of the scheme which includes many people in the jewish community as well including holocaust survivors mm -hmm. say look you know as i say right idea wrong place the government appears determined to force it through um they're supported by the labor party at the moment it's got a the project has a chair uh, from the conservative party and a co-chair from the labor party um eric pickles from the conservatives ed balls from labor mm -hmm. um but it's become somewhat accident prone as well. The um, the costs are ballooning, and the uh, the project has just lost its lead architect, mm -hmm. um, who was um, uh, who has been accused of um, uh, of inappropriate behaviour in, in in his practice. Mm. So. The so is there is, is there no is there no is there no other monument to the Holocaust in Britain? There are several. Exactly. Uh, so why? And I, I, I should explain. My impatience here is not be, again all those caveats. I'm not remotely against the notion of it happening. It just feels as though this idea of it of politicians wanting it to be close to Parliament feels well to borrow on that word again performative. It feels as though they want to be able to say, uh, "Look what we did," you know. Um, and uh, that's well, not, that, that's can not, I just that's... interrupt there, actually, Mark? Because there, there's there's a, a, a one uh, line of argument, which is having it next to Parliament, is actually a, a reminder of look what we didn't, because there's been a controversy well, ever since World War Two that the Allies could have done more to intervol, in, intervene in the process of the Holocaust, for example, by bombing railheads and bombing the uh, the crematoria. Yeah, uh, yeah, and now, and, now, and, now, and now they're continuing, and, and now they're continuing that attitude, arguably, by not listening to Holocaust survivors who say this is the wrong place for it. You know mm. what I mean? Like they, it's it, it, it's wanting wanting it on your terms in a place that looks good for you that you can easily have a photo photograph by you know that that's within the shadow of parliament and so on and so forth and i can understand why that feels like a powerful statement but if so many people are saying think about where you're putting this it's it's a tone deafness that is precisely the sort of nonsense that happened in the 1930s when people go oh i'm sure they wouldn't possibly you know do this to their own citizens in germany blah 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 and and it happened so uh it just so uh, Basically, this section of, of this uh, this explanation is something we've already talked about, I think, twice or three times now in Watching Brief. That's the reason why I'm a little bit impatient with it. Is If they're going to do it, if they're going to steamroll perpetuity laws as well, I guess, I guess. And also, of course, Labour aren't going to have a conversation about this lest they be accused of anti-Semitism, which is such an incredibly hot topic for that, for the opposition party. Uh, as we've seen just this week, yeah. Yeah, so basically this is happening. It's just happening, and uh, and, and it's just, I'm getting a bit I'm getting a little bit it, annoyed by it. Except, well, again, far be it from me to suggest that anything the current government is doing is performative, hmm. but um, it is becoming increasingly difficult to get legislation through both houses of parliament and into onto statute before the next general election, which has to be well, parliament has to break up just before Christmas. Yeah, that, and that, that, that's fine. But the, as I say, if if the Labour Party comes in and rolls back on it, that would be something that the then opposition Tories will use to beat them over the head with anti-Semitism. It was well, I can, I can bet you it will two, two things. It'll still go to uh, potentially still go to judicial review mm -hmm. because the opponents who want to save Victoria Tower Gardens as a as a quiet place mm. um, are determined to stop this. Mm -hmm. Right idea, wrong place. Mm -hmm. um, but 
there's another factor in this, which is the performative factor of this. Now, the, the government's um, notes to the King's speech tied this absolutely to the events in Gaza in the last few weeks and the appalling atrocities. Which, again, is cynical. Written. It's really cynical. Just because you're feeling bad about what's happening in another country at the moment doesn't mean that you can steamroll. Uh, sorry, I know, again, I'm ranting, but it's just... isn't That's really quite gross. You can support, if you want to, Israel in this instance. And it doesn't have to be tied to a National Holocaust Memorial that, that that's already controversial. I think that, that, again, that's why I'm so annoyed by it. It just it feels like it's a football. It's a convenient little football for, for some people, as opposed to a serious national centre of learning and a monument where people can visit and have well, uh, true well, reflection. Yeah, but look, as I was saying, there's um, uh, two, two things are problematic. One is they, they've lost lead architect to David Ajayek, mm -hmm. um, and he hasn't been replaced yet. Mm -hmm. uh, he, de he denies the claims that led to his stepping back, but he has stepped back. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly, perhaps even, back in July last year, 2022, the National Audit Office um, identified significant risks and fragilities in the management of the project, including costs, which, have, as I say, have escalated, mm -hmm. and including potential delays potentially caused by dealing with archaeology it actually says specifically in the report um because it's an archaeologically sensitive area it's the site of the old palace of westminster and westminster abbey uh, before that um and um before that potentially the landfall for the roman crossing at uh, of uh, of the river thames at lambeth mm -hmm. um and in july this year just a few months ago the holocaust memorial and learning center was rated by the Government Infrastructure and Projects Authority. That's the government's own watchdog that looks at all the government's programs. And they flagged it as red, which basically means undeliverable in its current form. Right. So okay. uh, I'll leave our viewer to decide whether this is actually a, a serious proposal or whether, it, again, it's just performance art from the government. And whether, and whether it'll continue to be performance art, because as I say, Keir Starmer won't touch it with a barge pole. Uh, it, uh, I should also say it feels annoying because it's taking up so much attention for uh, culture and heritage political conversation. And mm. once again, it's something happening in London. You know, I just, I just, anyway. Um, so given that we've spent uh, quite a while talking about that, let's move on to, uh, we have uh, a statement, uh, a rare statement from, um, from archaeological institutions, units and bodies on the conflict in Gaza, uh, from one not controversial topic to another. Uh, we have a statement from a uh, archaeological group, body and or institution on the topic. And you may recall a little while ago, Andy and I uh, got into interesting waters when we tried to encourage uh, bodies in the UK to, to make a statement or to have uh, a public opinion on what was happening in Ukraine. Uh, in this instance, it's nice to see, um, without uh, prompting, someone actually doing this with, in terms of Gaza. And in that sense, being uh, being a global citizen, um, especially given that, that across the world, archaeology and history is, uh, uni is universal and is important, and also is very much part of living um, environments. And here we have the Maritime Endangered Archaeology Group uh, in the Middle East and uh uh, North Africa, that's their, their realm of interest, that's their purview, um, mm. saying the following. Statement on Gaza on behalf of MAREA. Uh, as a project focused on endangered maritime cultural heritage, the uh, Maria uh, team mourns the tragic loss of Palestine, Pal Palestinian colleagues who have actively engaged in the safeguarding and documentation of this heritage. We deplore the continued violence, which has resulted in the displacement of our surviving colleagues, uh, and and how it has irreversibly affected local communities and has damaged or destroyed unique cultural heritage within Gaza. We offer condolences and express solidarity with all who have lost or are, or are missing loved ones. We remind all parties that the destruction of cultural heritage is unlawful and can be considered a war crime. Uh, obviously, they get they go on to to go into more detail about the uh, the situation. Um, Specifically, the fact that it was precipitated by actions on the seventh of October um, uh, by Hamas. Um, this that wasn't hard, was it, to do? Uh, and uh, and I find it interesting. I continue to find it interesting how uh, shy 
archaeologists are of talking about conflict. This this is probably the most difficult conflict to talk about uh, in the world uh, in terms of everything from politics to religion to how people might see your opinion on something, so on and so forth. And yet we have a clear statement talking about humanity, talking about cultural um, uh, cultural artifacts uh, and also pointing to uh, how the way in which modern warfare can result in unlawful damage to uh, to our shared heritage. What what do you make of this, uh, Andy? Um, like you, I just welcome archaeologists, and th these are um, maritime archaeologists. Mm. Uh, it's a partnership uh, between uh, two universities, Ulster and Southampton, mm. um, and also other partners. Um, in, in, including charitable partners who help fund it. Mm. Um, and um, they're acting as g global citizens, as you say, um, mm. responding to uh, an absolutely appalling humanitarian crisis. Mm. Uh, it's um, I mean, in the second paragraph, it goes on to uh, call for a, you know, a, a, a peace settlement, a two state solution. Um, as being the only just way to prevent this happening in future, um, but um, in the end, it, you know, it's it's a it's a humanitarian uh, comment for people who have an interest in conserving cultural heritage for the future, uh, mm. for when hopefully you know this stops, that there's still something left there for people in the region of whatever ethnicity, religion nationality um and 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 the people who would want to visit what is mm. an incredibly rich part of the world mm. in terms of its cultures yeah and uh you know both you and i consistently have have commented on conflict in archaeology and archaeologists and the humans involved and damaged by conflict um mm. for as long as i've known you and certainly for as long as i've been operating on twitter now x and now on blue sky um uh, it's mm. uh yeah, it's it's a it's 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 not easy, but I think it's important, you know, especially especially as well if 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 you want to to make connections between your work and uh, you know and, and relevant relevant life uh, current happenings globally as well. And uh, in this instance, yeah, you can see why why it was it within their purview to comment certainly. Um, but it's it's a it's it, it's both good but, and also a shame that that it is a, a unique voice at the moment. Seemingly, the, the 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 point I would make, I think, is that archaeologists spend a lot of time saying one of the added values of what we do, hmm. rather than just ticking a box on uh, a developer's planning permission. Hmm. Um, if we're doing it properly, we're doing things like placemaking. In some situations, it can be peacemaking. I was looking again in the, uh, in the week at a, uh, an initiative in Colombia, mm -hmm. in the, uh, the uh, Colombian Amazonia, where indigenous people have been trained as sort of um, heritage champions to help promote the area as a, an environmental and heritage tourist destination. Mm. And that's, again, uh, um, people from the University of Exeter have been involved in that. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, and Colombia, of course, is an, a country that's had its own and still has its own uh, issues with uh, internal conflicts and particularly the drug cartels and so on. So, you know, it, it, it's um, uh, archaeology can have such a positive benefit. It can make a really positive contribution to these yeah, they might seem like intractable problems, but you know, archaeology can even help with the baby steps. And but only if we're not, you know, if we're not too afraid to do so, mm. or not, or, or not too too aware of the the current opinion of someone in government, for example, because as we've seen this week these things change all the time their opinions change but you can plant your feet if you want to mm. uh finally uh, we've mentioned the conflict in gaza there's also news from the conflict in uh, ukraine uh, we have um uh, news in hyperallergenic uh, hyperaller hyperallergic sorry hyperallergic uh with the headline russian airstrike hits odessa fine arts museum uh, with a subheadline, at least eight people were injured in the attack. Uh, 
very briefly, this doesn't look look necessarily as though. Well, then again, I suppose we can't say for certain. It doesn't look as though the, the museum itself was actually being targeted, although it has clearly been damaged by uh, by uh, shelling. Um, you, as always, um, quite rightly, uh, pushed for us to include the current damaged, damaged cultural sites in Ukraine verified by UNESCO page. They're keeping a tally, which currently, as of the 2nd of November uh, 2023, UNESCO says they have verified damage to 327 sites. Uh, and this is since the 24th of February 2022. This constitutes 124 religious sites, 142 buildings of historical and or artistic interest, 28 museums, 19 monuments, 13 libraries and one archive. Uh, yeah, I, there's not really much more to say about that. We've got a link below. Uh, do check it out. Um, and yeah, you can see there's clearly some damage there. Um, but uh as ever it's always a case of uh but I, I, I mean you often talk about cock up and, and not conspiracy don't you in terms of um how things unfold mm. and one thing we definitely learned from this conflict is that um it appears that that that, that russian targeting capabilities aren't very uh, in very early days actually we saw russian targeting cap capabilities weren't um super accurate so yeah it's uh if this is adding to that tally that unesco is keeping an eye on definitely and, and it has to be added that as well as uh, being a World Heritage Site, uh, Odessa is a major port and most of the Russian activity has been aimed at uh, trying to shut down the port to prevent grain exports. Mm -hmm. um, this appears to be, uh, I mean, it, it appears to have been a missile strike of some kind which landed outside the museum and it, what we're seeing in the photographs is blast damage. The museum also points out that most of its contents had already been uh, removed to safety. Mm. Um, when the conflict began so um, it could have been a whole lot worse and it's entirely unclear whether the museum was targeted or whether it is that awful word collateral damage mm. um, yeah but um, I think the other thing to you know we're, we're coming into winter now in in, in that region and um, if uh, if it's anything like last year what we're going to be seeing is an increased attempt by the Russians to damage or destroy Ukraine's infrastructure, particularly its power generation, mm. um, uh, to uh, uh, in, in the depths of the winter. Uh, to make the population very uncomfortable, yeah. Indeed, indeed. And um, getting back to, to, the, to, to, to the government and the King's speech, the, um, uh, the new British Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, um, popped up in Kyiv yesterday, visiting President Zelensky. Mm. Um, Zelensky. So, um, and, and Valen continued support. So, um, we'll see what we'll see. But unfortunately, um, I think what people were hoping might have been a, a turnaround this summer um, hasn't happened and the war drags on. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the end of this watching brief episode. Uh, thank you as ever for watching. Uh, please do consider commenting below. Let us know if there's anything that you would like us to examine in future episodes. Uh, any conversation below, though, please do keep it civil, keep it respectful, and uh, keep it on topic as well. Some of the stuff we've been touching on th in this episode does tend to bring out myriad perspectives and varying uh standards in terms of uh quality and civility in terms of conversation so please do just just consider your words uh because uh we want to keep it civil here uh that said though do consider also supporting us on patreon uh and also do check out our pin badge collection on etsy both are linked in the video description below until next time do take care bye bye